and get started. Um, I'm Debbie Liu, the Associate Director of ESIG, and I wanted to welcome you all to a special webinar and also give you a little bit of background on ESIG. Uh, ESIG is a membership based nonprofit organization. We provide members with objective information, resources, and networking opportunities in support of renewable energy and energy systems integration decisions. We do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and task force activities, and we produce technical resource materials. Uh, we also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and speed. Uh, more information on GPST can be found at um, www.globalpst.org. Uh, we recently completed our fall workshop in Minneapolis. You can view that on the YouTube channel. Um, our workshops and monthly webinars are open to everyone, so please feel free to register anytime on the eSIG website. Uh, you can find us on the web at www.esig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. The cat's here to say hi. Uh, all the participant lines are going to be muted. And for a Q&A, we are using Slido.com. Okay. So if you have a question, go to Slido.com, enter uh, ESIG28, ESIG28, as right. the announced code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. And you'll see a thumbs up button next to questions so you can cast votes. To prioritize questions and we're going to save 10 or 15 minutes for Q and a at the end. We'll send out an email with the link. Um, for the video file for unanswered questions after the webinar, and you'll be able to download the presentation materials as well. So today's topic is on interregional yep. transmission yep. targets in Europe. Yep. So, um, as I mentioned, um. We had our fall workshop last month. Peter Markison of EnergyNet spoke in the closing plenary. About right, how right. Um, transmission operators. Yeah. Um, right, so I, I guess going back to the other car, I mean, I have this information in front of me, the um, the other person's insurance and stuff. It seems like we've never done any of that. Ryan, are you able to? Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, Peter Markison had spoken about how the European Association of Transmission System Operators, NSOE, has established interregional transfer capability between TSOs. It was such a good presentation, we decided to hold a public webinar on the, project, on the topic. And as you may be aware, FERC here in the US is considering a notice of proposed rulemaking on this. And there's going to be a conference December 5th and 6th by FERC. So this is very timely. We thank Peter for agreeing to do this on such short notice. Peter is a senior director at EnergyNet. He focuses on sharing the experience with integration of renewable energy to accelerate the global green transition. Peter's got more than 20 years of experience in the energy sector in Europe. Uh, he's also on our advisory council. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, again, just a short reminder to use slido.com event code of ESIG28. And now I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much for that, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak here today. Um, yeah, my name is Peter Markusen from James Transmission System Operator, and uh, I will talk today about how we work with uh, transmission capacity a bit between countries or cross border in Europe. And uh, say my my view will be a relative holistic view, but also based on my uh, uh, work in in the US for the last uh, uh, couple of years, uh, where we have tried to to share our knowledge in Europe on how to build out transmission and a uh, green transition also with focus on, on uh, offshore wind. So, so I try then also then to combine the European and US uh, experience here in, in, in my. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, in a guinea, uh, we are the uh, transmission system operator in uh, Denmark, uh, where we have the responsibility both for gas and electricity and uh, the do the. 
both the long-term planning and the short-term operation in our control, control center, 24 hours a day. Uh, we own by the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Utilities and uh, with the objective to uh, ensure an, an efficient green transition in Denmark, where we are uh, working for 100% green electricity in our system in 2030, and we have 50% today. Uh, it's not that I will say much about Energina today, it will more be on, on, on Europe. But uh, I, I would like just to mention that, that we are working very much on offshore wind and also now building these uh, energy islands or energy hubs for connecting a lot of uh, renewables to uh, make our transition uh, uh, make our transition efficient. So, yeah. So, why is it that interregional transmission is important? Um, there has been a number of studies, both in Europe and the US, and also in almost all uh, continents in, in, in the world, that transmission is important because it gives uh, security of supply, uh, both on uh, reduced uh, dependency on fossil fuels and uh, for electricity not served. It, it's also uh, accelerating the green transition. It reduces curtailment and emissions from fossil fuel. And then also it makes the green transition affordable, where in Europe it has been estimated that Transmission uh, between countries have uh, reduced electricity production costs with uh, five to nine billion euro per year. Uh, so, so there really is a, a economic benefit as well, and, and uh, uh, there is a large pool of money that can be used to compensate the losers because there are also some losers when you build interconnectors. So. And then, how to make it happen? Uh, what I will focus on today is the European level. Uh, but we also have to remember there is a national level, or in the US case, there is the, the state level. And then there is the uh, system operator level, the system level, uh, where in Europe we have the trans transmission system operators playing a very important part. And, and in the US, it's uh, more, <clears throat> more diverse setup uh, from also very unbundled setup to, to more vertical integrated systems. Um, but my focus will be on, on European level and especially on the harmonization of uh, our system operation and uh, electricity markets, and then also the coordination of our grid planning, both on short and long term, and how it then supports the build out of uh, cross border uh, transmission. So, uh, yes, next slide, please. So, so I will just start with the historic development, and and, uh, uh, and if you look at the the, the map to the right, uh, you, you can see the uh, 400 kV transmission grid in Europe, and it shows that there is a lot of connection uh, also across borders, uh, and uh, it has been so for uh, many many years in in Europe, but it has certainly increased in the last. Uh, 15 years uh, where we have had uh, the, the common European uh, electricity markets and also European regulation on, on our transmission grid build out. So, um, uh, but what's important here is to, to remember that, that one thing is the physics uh, where the electricity would like to flow, and then you have national borders, uh, and that's how often you, the regulatory structure of, of the electricity system. And they do not always coincide, and that is one of the, the challenges, both in Europe, but also in the US. And especially in the future, where you will see lots, a lot of more uh, renewables uh, being built in places uh, far away from the load, you will see even more uh, uh, transmission, and maybe also bottlenecks will move around from where they have been before to, to where they are now. So. Um, yeah, um, the, the target for Europe is 40% uh, green electricity in 2030, uh, and there is around 30% green electricity today. It's expected that in, in, in the next uh, 8 to 10 years, there will be a build out of around 1,000 gigawatt of uh, renewables, so uh, about the same size as uh, we expect to see in the US as well. The target is uh, climate neutral in 2050. So. Next slide, please. So when, when we look at, at uh, the history, then uh, here I've compared uh, 2011 with uh, 2020, and there has been an increase in, in uh, uh, 10 gigawatt of, uh, uh, or more than 10 gigawatt of uh, uh, cross-border transmission capacity. Uh, but when we look at, at uh, uh, cross-border capacity, then it, it's actually split in a number of uh, uh, regions uh, where, uh, uh, capacity is coordinated and uh, also operated. Uh, uh, so, so it's not always each country that, that we are looking at, but we are looking at the regions and then the, each uh, uh, connector. 
uh, but it should not make that difference. But just to say that that uh, we have this uh, special setup in Europe that is uh, important to be aware of when, when we then talk about uh, the use of transmission capacity. Uh, in Denmark, we are actually part of uh, uh, both the, uh, the Hansa uh, capacity calculation region and also the Nordic capacity calculation region. So, but there's been an increase, and uh, that's uh, mainly in, uh, actually in all regions there have been an uh, increase in transmission, but especially in, in also in the continent, there have been an increase, uh, but also from the Nordic to the neighboring countries. So, next slide, please. So then also, if we then look at the, the exchange, so one thing is increase in the uh, capacity, but also the exchange have uh, increased uh, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, and also for the last 10 years, uh, especially, uh, from around 250 uh, terawatt hours to now uh, around 350 terawatt hours. And this year of, of uh, export compared to the consumption is uh, uh, also increased from around 10% to 15%. So. So there has been an increase in, in uh, uh, exchange of electricity. Uh, um, and today, the uh, total consumption in the 27 European uh, Union countries is, is around 2.4 or 2,458 terawatt hours. So also, again, just to compare with the US, uh, uh, around the same size, some smaller, a bit smaller. So. Uh, and uh, the number is also the same if we look for imports. So. Uh, uh, Though there are a lot of differences between the countries, and uh, as you can see in the next slide, um, if you look at the net imports in a number of countries, um, then some countries are very dependent on imports, whereas other countries are exporting a lot. Where we have uh, uh, Italy, Finland, uh, Hungary being quite dependent on, on imports, then France, Sweden, Germany, Norway, they are uh, exporters. Uh, and, and now these numbers are from 2021, but it has actually changed a lot during 2022, where, uh, uh, for example, France have had a lot of restrictions on, on their nuclear, and also Norway has been very dry. So the figures look different in, in 2022 and, and uh, normally changes from, from year to year. So, And uh, then also on the figure to the right, if we look at, at the net imports relative to demand, uh, then uh, Romania, uh, Hungary, Latvia, Portugal, and also Denmark, uh, we import a lot compared to demand. Uh, but this uh, does not necessarily mean that we don't have capacity to cover our own supply. It just means that uh, it's cheaper for us to import uh, than it is to produce ourselves. So, so you can also see this as uh, the, the countries that benefit a lot from, from the uh, importing compared to producing uh, ourselves. Uh, but also it, it shows the interdependency that we now have between uh, all European countries. And uh, uh, when we look at security of supply uh, uh, on a national uh, uh, level, then we need to also take into account uh, uh, what happening, what's happened in our neighboring countries. So, so we do also have uh, uh, security of supply uh, assessments on, on European level. I'm not saying much about that today, but, but just important to say that uh, security of supply is just not a, a national concern, though it is decided on national level then it is something that happens on, on, on EU level. So, next slide. So, that was the history. So, so now I, I will give a very brief overview of the European regulation that, that then uh, uh, facilitates uh, the exchange and, and the, the development of transmission capacity. And here, three uh, uh, organizations are important. Uh, one is, of course, the European uh, Commission that makes the laws, uh, the directives that, that we have in, in, in Europe. There is uh, NSOE, that's the organization of uh, uh, now 37 TSOs, as I remember, and not just in the European Union, but in, in, in all of Europe, uh, where we work together and uh, uh, supplies the uh, uh, drafts for our uh, network codes uh, and also have the coordination on security of supply and our grid planning. And then there is ASA, and that's the, the European uh, energy regulator. Uh, we still have national uh, regulators, but when it comes to European uh, regulation that uh, uh, <coughs> influences uh, cross-border activity, then it's often ASA that takes the decisions there. So, so, so these are the three important uh, uh, organizations. So next slide, please. And, and uh, there is a lot of European regulation, and, and this is just a very, very short brief of uh, what we have. Uh, um, but what's important to say is that, that uh, uh, what drives the single 
or drives the European market is the Single European Act that was uh, agreed in 1986, where you should have the free, f free flow of goods between European borders in, in the European Union. And uh, that also included electricity. And based on that, uh, a number of directives have then been uh, uh, decided uh, uh, by the European Union on uh, unbundling, on the electricity market, on harmonization of grid codes, uh, network codes, and also on, on uh, this 70% uh, uh, capacity uh, to be made available on interconnectors for, for the market. And uh, now also continued development of, of our markets and infrastructure uh, has, has been made. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, support for uh, the infrastructure with the, the 10E regulation, Trans-European Networks for Energy Regulation, where, uh, for example, uh, there have been some non-binding targets for minimum 10% and then later on 15% of import capacity compared to total generation capacity. This is not a binding target. It is a non-binding, but it's then also used to... Uh, say, uh, discuss where could it be good to develop infrastructure, and I will get, get back to that. Then we now have had the European Green Deal and uh, Renew Europe uh, that really supports the build out of, of renewables, uh, but also the infrastructure needed, both for gas, electricity, and also for, for hydrogen. So, so this is the very short overview, but just to say that uh, this is where the, the initiative comes from. So next slide, please. So when we then look at the regulation, then there is very uh, uh, detailed and uh, uh, binding regulation on our system operation and on, on our markets, uh, where there are European directives that are directly uh, implemented as law in each European country. But when it comes to grid development and, and decision on, on grid investments, then that is still a national decision. So, so if you want to build an interconnector, uh, the European regulation cannot decide on that. It can support it and facilitate it, but it's still a decision between Denmark and, for example, uh, uh, UK, uh, that we are now building a new interconnector between Denmark and UK. That's something that is decided between Danish and uh, uh, British uh, uh, politicians. Uh, but of course, it, it is supported by, uh, say, the, the EU grid planning that, that shows that it, it might be a good idea and also shows that it's a, a good business case. So. Next slide, please. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, Ryan? Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, my computer froze for a second. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ryan. Just started to get concerned. Uh, yeah, so, so, so when it comes to the European electricity grid development, then uh, this is coordinated between all uh, the national TSOs. We do it in, in SUI. Uh, and uh, we develop this 10-year uh, network development plan. Uh, it, it says 10 years, but we actually look uh, more than 10 years ahead. We look 20 years uh, ahead. And, and also now actually to 2050 uh, to, to see how we can reach or support to reach the uh, uh, climate neutral target. It is developed uh, every second year, uh, uh, but things are moving quite fast at the moment. So they're also done some more, uh, you could call it sensitivity an an analysis. And as mentioned, it, it is a national decision then to build out, but there are some uh, support with uh, what we call uh, projects of common interest, PCI projects. Uh, that can then uh, um, get support for project development by the European Union and also investment uh, uh, support. And also, uh, uh, as part of the regulation, uh, uh, approval processes can then also be uh, speeded up, especially if it uh, involves uh, third or fourth party uh, countries. So, uh, next slide, please. So, so if you look at uh, uh, this 10-year network development plan, it is a, a, a quite uh, detailed, it's a quite large process with a lot of people involved. And, and uh, if anyone of you who are involved are listening here, then thank you very much for a very good job. And, and uh, if you go to the homepage, there is a lot of good information that is 
used by all TSOs and project developers and uh, uh, regulators and uh, stakeholders in our energy systems, because it really is a, a very good overview of what, what, what is happening in Europe. And it's based on a number of scenarios and then made very, very detailed uh, analysis of, of our system, including our grid and, uh, uh, and also a number of technical uh, analysis uh, where we also look at security of supply, uh, uh, how it uh, influences uh, curtailment. Uh, there is also an economic uh, business case being made for the different uh, uh, projects that are, are proposed. It's of course not enough to do a business case on it, but it's done in, in uh, the same way for all projects, so it's uh, easy to, to compare. Uh, and then it ends up with a number of uh, recommendations for, uh, for projects that, that are uh, important to, to reach our uh, climate target in, in Europe. And to the map to the right, you, you can see um, that we are looking on, on specific interconnectors. Uh, we are also looking at areas where there might be a need for, for interconnectors. and. Uh, uh, for example, in the North Sea uh, between England and Germany and Denmark, uh, there are the blue areas where an, an offshore grid are, are being developed for the offshore wind development, where there is expected more than 350 gigawatt of offshore wind being developed towards 2050. Um, another example is, is the Baltic countries that are, are supposed to be de uh, syn uh, synchronized from Russia and synchronized with Europe, uh, the continental Europe, very important. A project that is going on uh, at the moment. Uh, so, so there are a number of uh, projects here that are um, are being uh, looked at as uh, also projects for uh, common interests. So, uh, so and and what was worth noticing here is also that uh, most of the projects is actually between two countries. So. For example, compared to a U.S. setup where there could be long distance uh, HVDC lines from uh, uh, the middle of, of US, U.S. to the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, uh, that is not something that, that we are really uh, handling in uh, uh, this 10 year network development plan. It, it could be, but focus is on especially on, on cross border and also internal build outs of, of the grid. But that's also because we have a quite a strong and messed grid in, in, in most of uh, most of Europe compared to, to the US. So uh, next slide, please. So just just a few words on, on these uh, project of uh, common interests, um, where the, uh, the criteria is that uh, they should have impact on at least two European member countries, uh, enhanced market integration, um, increase competition on energy markets, enhance security of supply, and then also contribute to the climate goals. And that is uh, mainly uh, integration of renewable uh, electricity for wind, solar. Uh, and then if, if uh, a project is approved as a project for uh, common interest, then it can uh, have faster, more efficient permit granting procedures, uh, also improved regulatory treatment in, in each national country where uh, there is a commitment then to uh, look at these projects and, and move as fast as possible. And then there is possible to have uh, uh, financial support both for the development. And then there is also this Connecting Europe facility where uh, uh, 5.85 billion euros uh, for the period of 2021 to 27 can be given as uh, support for, for, for the investments. Uh, just as two examples, for example, in Denmark, we have built interconnector between Denmark and Holland where we received uh, around 120 uh, million euro. And for another project we have between uh, Eastern Denmark and Germany, where we have also connected an uh, offshore wind farm, uh, the Krieger's Flak common grid solution. We also received uh, 150 million euro as a, a investment support. So, so it is something that, that can support the, the, the build out of infrastructure. So, so this, this was just the, say the overall regulation for, on, on a European level. So, so if you take next slide. So, so it's one thing is then to, to build out the, the interconnectors. Another thing is then to uh, finance it and, and also have efficient utilization. And what I will explain here in the next slide is uh, on the one hand, the financing, but also uh, uh, there is a 70% a, a, a rule where at least 70% of the internet interconnection capacity should be made available to the market to ensure that you have this exchange of electricity between the countries. And also the markets are, are used for balancing and uh, uh, 
uh, then also in, in, in that sense, it's important that you have availability on the interconnectors. But the way that we organized in Europe, and, and now I have put in this small uh, uh, bubble saying that no rules without exemptions, because there is a lot of exemptions here, but the overall rules are explained to the left, where you have the synchronous areas, where you have, uh, for example, the Nordics, you have England, you have continental Europe, they are, uh, they are uh, each a synchronous area with their own frequency regulation and the dimensioning done uh, for all of the uh, uh, for, for all of the, the, the area. So uh, then each, each synchronous area, there is a number of uh, low frequency control blocks. Uh, normally, that is uh, each uh, country. Though in, in the Nordics, uh, the control block is for all of the Nordics. Um, and then uh, each uh, LFC block is a number of LFC areas. Uh, that's normally then each uh, TSO, but also the block and the area and the TSO is the same size. Uh, and in the low frequency uh, control block, that is where we do the dimensioning for the balancing reserves. Uh, that is the say the slower reserves, whereas the frequency reserve are the fast reserves. And in the LFC area, there you are then uh, obliged to ensure the balancing through balancing market and the buying of capacity. And then you're also monitoring the balancing uh, with the area control area. And then to do this, we then also have then the market bidding areas that are often the same as the LFC areas, uh, but again, with, with some uh, few exemptions. So, uh, so normally uh, that when you do your balancing, you can then do the balancing through your, uh, 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 the electricity market, the common European uh, electricity market. So, so if you move on to, to the next slide, um, so if you look at, at the common European electricity market, then it, it consists of, uh, uh, there is a financial market, but that's no, no European regulation on, 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 on at all. Not much European regulation on that. The important market is, is the day ahead, where you uh, have an auction uh, each day for the 24 hours the next day, and then a price for each hour. Then you have the intraday that you can use then to uh, <clears throat> trade if you have uh, changes uh, compared to what you have been in in your day ahead as a consumer or a generator. And then finally, you have the balancing market, and that's where the TSOs take over and uh, start balancing the system. And it, it is done a bit different ways in different European countries, but the main setup is that, that then the, the TSOs uh, ensures the balancing in uh, the operational hour. Uh, what I will focus on here is the day ahead, because that's also where you have the main financing of uh, the, the interconnector through the congestion rent, and also uh, where you have the 70% uh, rule, where at least 70% of the capacity of the interconnector should be made available for the day ahead market. Um, yeah, so we take the next slide. So, so now I'll give a, a very simple example on how it works uh, uh, with uh, uh, the electricity prices. And, and this is from uh, the Nord Pool, uh, one of the power exchanges in, in Europe. There are a, a number of power exchanges. And, and what they do is that uh, say they handle the day ahead and intraday uh, uh, where they make sure there is a clearing price and also that there is a continuous pay as bid market for, for intraday. And actually the power exchanges can now compete. So for example, in the Nordics, we have... Uh, more power exchanges uh, uh, that are then competing on uh, uh, giving the best service for uh, uh, for the day ahead and the uh, day ahead market. And as I hope you can see on this slide that there are differences in, in the electricity prices uh, in each of the market areas. Um, and um, uh, for example, here in, in Denmark, uh, this is from the 16th of November between 10 and 11. The price was uh, 31.26 uh, euro per megawatt hour. And in Germany, it was 174.42 euro per megawatt hour. So, so quite a large price difference, whereas there were no price difference between the, uh, some of the Nordic market areas with Denmark. So it just shows that there is a, a efficient flow and no bottleneck in, in, in our system. You could also have hours where we have the same price as in, in Germany, but in, in this example of just looking at, at the difference between Denmark and uh, uh, Germany. So if you take the next slide. And on this one, you can then see the capacities that are made uh, available to the market. Uh, and and uh, you will then see that, that most of the capacities are actually more than the 70% uh, capacity. Um, uh, though there are some restrictions in Germany, uh, I'll not get into that here. Um, but it, it's uh, uh, there are 
sometimes some some problems, uh, and then you uh, are, are allowed to reduce your capacity. Uh, and if we then take the next one, uh, so if they then look at the flows, uh, then uh, if you had been able to compare with the last slide, you will see that most of uh, the flow uh, or the capacity would then be used, especially if there is a, a price difference between the countries. And then if you take the next, uh, here I've then tried to look at uh, then well, what is then the congestion rent that is used for financing. And uh, in this example, uh, the congestion rent is, is then the difference in, in prices where you have the 31 in Euro per megawatt hour in Denmark and 174 in Germany. And then if you then uh, uh, take the difference and uh, times the uh, capacity in the interconnector that was 1,110 megawatt, then you have a congestion rent of uh, uh, 159,000 euro. So that's actually quite a lot of money. And that money, uh, the TSOs in Denmark and Germany, we can split. And then it's, it's uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, the overall rule is then uh, that, that you can use that for, uh, for uh, transmission, both for the operation and maintenance and for investment in, in new uh, uh, transmission capacity. And so the reason for the difference in price is that uh, in this hour in Denmark, we had a lot of wind and the wind production was actually higher than uh, uh, the load. And um, so we are exporting to, to Germany and uh, in Germany, there is also a lot of solar and wind, but also coal oven running and uh, gas, uh, probably coal and gas setting the price, but also the load is actually higher than uh, the production. So they are importing uh, and maybe also here again, because importing might be cheaper for them then to actually make sure that they could uh, fulfill their own demand in this one hour. It could be the opposite in, in, in another hour where, for example, if there is no wind in Denmark, then we can import from uh, Germany or Norway, for example. And then we will then probably see higher prices in Denmark than in our neighboring countries. So, <coughs> so, so, so this is uh, how it works. And, and then you can get uh, uh, congestion rent. So take the next slide. Uh, yeah, say I've, I've made a, a, a few slides here on the uh, economic theory. I will not go into detail with that. Uh, so, but but when you get the slides, you can 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 look at that. So so take the next one, Ryan, and the next one again. But just you see, the point is that there is a social welfare uh, when you start exchanging electricity between each countries. So, so that's also what we do in in, in Denmark, uh, where we are well connected. And here uh, I've showed the both the import and export. So it's not that the electricity is just running one way, it's really uh, changing from hour to hour, whether it's import or exports. And uh, we are then getting congestion incomes in, in uh, Denmark. And on, on the figure to the left, you can see uh, uh, our congestion income on each of the different borders from uh, in, in 18, 19, 20, 21. And actually it's uh, contributing to uh, financing 25% of uh, the costs that we had at have a, at uh, Energinet as the electricity uh, transmission system operator. So, so it's also a part for for financing the TSO and the investments we have in in new transmission grid. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So, back to this 70% uh, rule, where um, uh, you say the main idea behind the European regulation was that uh, uh, electricity should flow and then also based on this congestion rent there would be an incentive to uh, have as much capacity available to the market as possible. Uh, but still uh, it is lacking in a number of countries for different reasons and uh, one of them is, is it can be system operation and also lack of, of uh, internal uh, build out of grid especially with uh, a lot of wind and solar being built then there might be internal congestions and then it can be expanded to, uh, or it can be uh, by some uh, countries expanded to the border, and then there will be less exchange than the 70% rule. But to be able to get the, the socioeconomic benefit for Europe from, from exchanging electricity, uh, there is this incentive or, or then binding rule for increasing the, the utilization of the grid. Um, this is a relative new rule and uh, uh, it is to be delivered by 2025. So each country has some time to uh, uh, do some uh, uh, actions to, to fulfill this rule. Uh, but, but they are uh, supposed to deliver a report to ASA or European regulator each year 
and then ASA goes into a dialogue with each country if they're not able to fulfill this rule. Um, and, and the calculator methodology, I have here made it very simple. There is actually, a, a, there's a link on the slide, 39 pages describing in detail how the, uh, it should be calculated. But, but the overall rules is that, that uh, you do it for each market bidding zone border uh, is, is calculated separately to see if they fulfill the 70%. It's based on the net transfer capacity uh, that uh, is then made available to the market. Uh, uh, planned, unplanned orchards is, is uh, uh, not included, uh, or at least to take take uh, take into account, and then it should be calculated as hour by hour availability. So uh, there really is a need uh, to you cannot just see it as an overall annual average. You need to look at it on an hour to hour, and, and then uh, accumulate that and see if you fulfill the seventy percent uh, target. So, but there is also some uh, exemptions here from uh, the main rules. Uh, but uh, um, it, it is described, maybe not clearly, but at least it is described in these 39 pages. So, um, and here, ASA plays a very important role here in, 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 in uh, creating the transparency. I know these figures are quite small, but it, it gives an idea. Uh, if you look at the figure to the, to the left, there are a number of, of uh, uh, interconnectors is listed where uh, many of them, uh, they are uh, fulfilling the 70% rule, but there are then also a number that are not and uh, uh, to the right uh, on the top is just showing that there is actually still a benefit by using uh, the interconnector, not just for day ahead, but also for intraday and for, for balancing. Uh, uh, today we have common Euro, European day ahead intraday market, but also a common European balancing market will be uh, introduced uh, actually uh, for some countries already this year. And, and then uh, the rest of Europe will follow in, in the coming years. So there's a lot of benefits still to be uh, uh, to, to be found. And, and then also they calculate what would the benefit be uh, for a number of borders if they had increased their uh, capacity uh, and then fulfilled the 70% rule. And, and that is in, in million euros. So for some countries, you say it is actually a lot of money that, that can be found here. Of, of course, if, if you increase exchange of uh, electricity, then it might be a higher price in one country and lower price in another. But the overall benefit for each country should be so high that, that there are possibilities to say compensate in different ways uh, if you see higher prices or at least uh, you, you could say you, you get benefit to uh, finance new transmission grid also internal grid uh, through, 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 through this so so there is really a socioeconomic benefit and, and asia is doing a, a good and hard job uh, to uh, make sure that it, it is done in a, a fair way so uh, next slide, please. Uh, but also with, with this interdependency, there is a need to, uh, on European level, to look at, at uh, the uh, generation adequacy. And, and here's one example for, for the summer of 2022, where we are looking at how, how the situation is and, and uh, what can be done to, to help each other in the countries where there might be some uh, 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 challenges. So, yeah, next slide, please. So, uh, I now I've talked about electricity, but, but it's actually also very important to look beyond onshore transmission uh, uh, because when we look into the future, uh, there is electrification. We foresee a, a more than doubling in our electricity consumption in the next uh, 10 to, to 20 years. And also uh, with hydrogen being produced from power, uh, there will be a, a coupling between the electricity and the gas sector that is very important to include as well. So, so if you take the next slide. Um, so, so what is done also now in, in this 10-year uh, network development plan is that we are looking at hydrogen, both at projects and uh, the infrastructure behind it. And also there are a number now of uh, organizations, interest organizations in, in Europe that are looking at how to establish a, a hydrogen infrastructure backbone. Um, so that is something that we're going to look at uh, much more in, in, in the next uh, versions of, of our grid planning. So we'll take the next slide. And another issue is then also uh, offshore wind uh, uh, transmission grids, where it's not just about uh, connecting one offshore wind farm to one country, but it is to establish a, 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 a backbone also offshore, where you're connecting the offshore wind so that the electricity can be sent to the countries where you have uh, the highest prices or the largest need. And also to create a redundancy in our systems 
and and uh, again, uh, uh, the congestion rent can be part of the financing of, of both transmission and the offshore wind uh, that we're looking at, because there is a need for a lot of infrastructure to establish the offshore wind in the North Sea. So, and then also in the future, it might not all be transported by uh, uh, electricity grid. It can also be produced uh, hydrogen offshore and then actually transported as as hydrogen. So, so that's also something that is important to to, to look at. So next slide, please. And then finally, uh, one thing is to build out grids, but it's also important to look at all other solutions. And they are also now being included in our 10 year network development plan with storage and different kinds of uh, uh, flexibility, uh, operational solutions, for example, also with dynamic line rating. Uh, and also to improve the market solutions, uh, changing the bidding areas to give better incentives to uh, more local uh, markets, maybe more uh, Nodal markets, as it's known in, in the U.S., and, and of course, this is done in, in a very close dialogue with uh, uh, stakeholders in, in, in what we are working with. So, so that that's also part of it. So, to to sum up, uh, take the next slide. Um, then, yeah, there are a lot of benefits, and then to the picture to the right, it just shows some of the benefits that have been calculated from the last uh, ten-year network development plan, and that is really. Uh, big numbers uh, uh, when we look towards 2040 uh, from uh, increasing our grid. And here it, it, it says that there is a need of, of around 23 gigawatt of new uh, transmission capacity. So uh, that, that, that really is, is, is a lot um, compared to also what we already have. So a lot of transmission needs to be, be built out. Um, uh, if you take the next one, then you can see that, that uh, the reason why we have a lot of transmission is, of course, that it is a, a very high EU priority and have been that for, for many years. Uh, there is a large socioeconomic benefit and also security of supply. Uh, we have now also a good uh, regulation to support it with the electricity market and system operation guidelines. And also we have uh, ASA uh, that creates the transparency and also uh, um, uh, the, the, the framework for also these uh, agreements between countries where you have, where, when you have the 10 year network development plan. And uh, then say in the green transition, we then need to think the energy systems together. And that's then also part of the future and we can start doing that already. But there are of course some challenges. And, and one thing is to accelerate the development because we need to do something now. and We don't have the final answer for that. And also one thing is to have cross border capacity, but we also need to build out the, the internal grids uh, and then we need to support the sector coupling and, and the increased flexibility. So that's also where we try to learn from each other in Europe and, and uh, also from, from other countries. And then just a short uh, comparison with uh, the US, where uh, these are just some examples of, 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 of what could be interesting. That is, uh, on the one hand, we have a totally different uh, setup in, 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 in the US. Uh, with uh, uh, the RTOs and the ISOs and also national balancing authorities. So there is room for many different solutions and, and uh, they can say compete with each other and, and you can try a lot of different things. Then also we have the private owned transmission companies uh, uh, where we have the TSOs in Europe uh, and also being, they're the main owners of the transmission grid. So uh, uh, you, you might have a potential to, to move faster because we are, are, are regulated in, in, in different ways. So. That is, is one thing that could be interesting. Then on financing, uh, well, you have regulation on federal level. Uh, so, uh, whereas in Europe, uh, we, you know, of course, we do have the congestion range, but uh, otherwise it is actually national decisions to, 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 to build out. You have the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, where you have good support for, for transmission as well. So, there are potential now. And then also for uh, the planning, where you have now taken uh, some of the first steps for national transmission and development plan and looking at uh, uh, also long distance and not just cross border. And here I've shown a picture from the ESIC transmission uh, grid development uh, plan that they have just or released uh, earlier this year. So, so thank you. This was a, a very fast introduction to the European setup and, and uh, how it uh, uh, how, how it looks and uh, a very brief comparison to what, what happens in the US at the moment. So, and just to remember, as written in, in the top, uh, the challenges, they are the same, 
and that could also be for uh, in, in Asia or in, in Africa or South America if we have participants from those uh, continents. And the important thing is actually the differences we have because that is also where we get the inspiration and innovation to find the new solutions that we are that that, that we all need. So, so thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for that um, very thorough and broad um, presentation. We've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try and group these a little bit. Um, start with the ones that um, maybe are more related to uh, the interregional transmission yeah. targets and, and then get into a little bit of the cost allocation and intra versus interregional and, and then address some of the, the remaining questions. But um, just to, I, I think there may have been a little bit of confusion. So just mm. to be really mm. clear, can you talk a little bit about the the fifteen yeah. percent of generation capacity by twenty thirty target? Mm -hmm. um, some people are wondering if it's legally binding. I think you said it was not legally yeah. binding. Can you talk a little bit about about what that is and where it came from? Yeah, um, you can say in, in in Europe we have a number of. Uh, European targets where each country then uh, gives uh, their idea of what, what, what they can reach in this target. It could be on energy efficiency, on, on uh, 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 renewables. Uh, uh, we have also CO2 uh, quotas. They are, though, then binding. Uh, but then also on transmission capacity, where in, in European uh, set up the uh, uh, European Commission and then looked at what, what would be a good sh share of transmission capacity compared uh, uh, to the uh, generation capacity you have. And there they have then come, come up and said, based on what we see today, then it uh, say the 10 percent and then later on increased to 15 percent could, could be a good target uh, as an average in, in Europe. But for some countries, for example, Denmark, we, we have, uh, 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 say, around uh, uh, 100 percent compared, uh, depending on how you, you uh, define our capacity. Uh, whereas other countries have uh, much less, uh, but that also depends on how large the country is. Because for France and Germany, where well, they they are large countries where they have a lot of internal transmission capacity, uh, and and then uh, it might not be so uh, beneficial to have a lot of uh, export capacity. Whereas for other countries, uh, also if they only have a few borders, it would be good with more transmission capacity compared to other countries that have a lot of borders. For example, as Denmark or, or uh, uh, yeah, Germany as well. So, uh, so, so it, it is difficult to say that that uh, you, you should have an overall target. But but on an average, they have then set this uh, 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 target of, of of the fifteen percent, and saying that could be good at least for the countries that have limited uh, uh, transmission capacity to try to increase that, and also a part of uh, uh, the criteria for uh, for the projects for for common interest. So. So what if a country decided they don't want to build an interconnector? Like what if uh, Portugal didn't want to interconnect with Spain? Could they opt out of that? Uh, you could say if Portugal and Spain wants to build an interconnector, that, then that, that, that's an agreement between Portugal and Spain. Uh, of course, as, as uh, could, could be seen in the tenure development, development plan, there might be a proposal also, also from, you would say, a market stakeholder can actually come with a proposal for a project, and then it can be a part of the uh, Tinian network development plan. So maybe a, a market participant is proposing a project between Spain and Portugal, and then it is included in Tinian network development plan. But still, it is a decision between Portugal and Spain if they want to build an uh, interconnector. Then, then the EU can, of course, try to support it in different ways if they think it would be important for the European uh, 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 energy system to, to build an interconnector between Portugal and Spain. Now, this is just an illustrative uh, example. So, uh, but also it, it, it is, it's often uh, also promoted by you say, some countries that, that say we would like to have more interconnectors. So how Europe, how can you help us? So, so there are also countries that, that would like to have more transmission and they can really use this tool, uh, the, the network plan and the project of common interest as, as uh, active uh, tools to, to develop the transmission grid. And how are the costs allocated when an interconnector is, let's say Portugal and Spain are going to build an yeah. interconnector, who pays for that? Yeah, well, well now, uh, I would actually rather like to use the Danish example because I, I, I know them better. So, but, so for example, now, now with the interconnector between Holland and Denmark, that was uh, uh, 
uh, commissioned here in, in, in 2019. Um, there we have uh, decided to split the costs and uh, the earnings 50-50 uh, between uh, uh, the TSOs in Denmark and Holland. Uh, but it, and then also we then own half of it each, and they, it is then uh, split just in the middle of the, the North Sea, and then say, um, uh, from this point it's our responsibility, and from the other point, other side of the point, then it's the responsibility of, of the Dutch TSO tenant. Uh, so then of course we have a cooperation agreement on how to to run our integrators, but it can be done in different ways. Uh, also, for example, Holland and UK they have uh, established a, a separate purpose company. For the interconnector between Holland and, and and UK, and then they then have each fifty uh, percent share in that company. So so it can be done in in in, in different ways. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's also a few questions about zonal versus nodal yeah. prices, and I, I believe the way you do this is um, a zonal prices. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, could there be gains if you moved to nodal pricing, and and also you know. I think you referred to this already, like in Germany, you might have congestion mm. between the north and the south. And so if you had um, nodal pricing, that might help with uh, managing that as yeah. well within a region. Yeah, there is it's a lot of discussion going on whether there should be changes in the bidding areas. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of analysis being done. And, and also uh, uh, there will be some uh, decisions uh, relative soon uh, on whether there should be changes in the bidding area so that they better reflect the, uh, the congestions in the grid and not the national borders. So, so, so that, that is one way. As for example, in the Nordics, uh, we have uh, 12 bidding areas and, and we have the same, uh, or we are a bit larger than Germany if you look at the geographical size, but compared, they, they just have one zone. So, of course, you can do it in different ways. And in, in the Nordics, we have chosen to have the uh, more market areas uh, and the balancing areas uh, reflecting uh, the congestion in in, uh, in our grid. So, so it can be done differently, uh, but 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 that, that is one way of doing it. Then there is the discussion on on, on uh, zonal versus versus nodal, and and uh, 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 there is a lot of discussion going on how to develop the electricity market. Also, trying to combine the nodal and the zonal uh, approach. Because we also have more local congestions, and, and that, and also we have an incentive to try to locate new uh, consumption where you also have the production. For example, all this uh, hydrogen that we expect to be produced, it would be good if they locate closer to the consumption. And here, some kind of of more uh, nodal pricing could be good, but it could also be then through our our uh, geographical tariffs, for example, uh, could also be a way of doing it. So. Uh, so they'll be looking at different things here, and, and uh, that could be also be interesting to learn more from the US how you handle your uh, uh, build out of transmission in a more nodal uh, system compared to the European zonal system. Right, and I, I think as part of the intent of that seventy percent rule, <clears throat> which is a binding target, part mm -hmm. of that intent is to um, get the TSOs to manage their congestion inside their TSO yeah. so that they can have more um, capability on the interconnectors. Yes, it is to give incentive to use the interconnectors better. And, and, uh, and you also say that, that uh, it, it should be mentioned that uh, the, the European electricity market has developed over the last uh, uh, almost 20 years and, and uh, still some uh, 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 countries in, in Eastern Europe, they, they, they're not part of the EU, but they are also being coupled to, to the electricity market. Uh, so, so some of them, it's also to get them on the way and try to help them and, and do some best practice uh, uh, sharing on how to improve then the, the use of the interconnectors, because it really is a, a quite large step to go from being uh, in a, a country where you have the security of supply based on your own resources uh, and then to go to a, a dependency on your neighboring countries where you need to open up your interconnectors and import and export electricity. So, so we have also had our concerns in, at the, in the Guinness, uh, but, but now this is the way we do it and, and uh, it, it works and we can see that uh, uh, the electricity flows on the interconnectors and, and it, it's helping us in our integration of renewables and there is a socioeconomic uh, benefit to it. So, But also, see, especially for, for some of the larger areas, or you have internal grid congestion. So it, it, it can be a challenge just to let the electricity flow freely in, in, in our uh, AC grids in, in continental Europe, for example. Uh, so, 
so there is a need to uh, keep an eye on it from from ASA side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I'm looking at uh, some of the other questions that are a little more general. So, uh, one person asked about the primary limitation across the European transmission grid. Is it thermally limited or stability limited? Do you know? If well, well, you can say the, the, uh, when you look at the synchronous areas, uh, then uh, you say they are actually uh, quite robust because it is large systems, uh, um, especially the continent where you have uh, a very, very large uh, synchronized area. Uh, looking at the Nordics, where we also part of, uh, say, so is a small area, and, uh, and we, we we see some challenges with the the, the frequency. Uh, but we are then also then then changing our structure instead of having one uh, large LFC uh, C area. We then also splitting into more LFC areas that then need to keep their own balance. Uh, so that's uh, expect to to help. Uh, so, uh, uh, but 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 in general, uh, so the energy flows quite well uh, in in in, uh, in the areas of, of of Europe, and and we have not, but we do see that that uh, uh, this more and more inverter based uh, energy systems uh, that that's also being discussed in the US. That is, that is also being discussed in Europe, and, and we see that inertia is, is getting a challenge in the Nordics and um, partly in the continent, but of course also in, in the United Kingdom, that is an, you say an island as well. Uh, so, uh, so that's also tried to be handled with market solutions where you then try to introduce uh, fast frequency reserves that can then help support uh, delivering uh, the, the reactions in, in, in the frequency that is, is necessary. Uh, so. Okay, thanks. Um, Rune Grunberg Junker asks, who exactly mm. pays the congestion mm. rent? Yeah, you, you can say you have the different prices uh, areas where, uh, in my example, we had around 30 euro in Denmark and 174 euro in Germany. And, and then there is a, uh, uh, say, if you produce in, in Denmark, then you get uh, 31 euro, but we send around one gigawatt of electricity in, in this one hour to Germany. Uh, where we then get 174 euro for that electricity. And that benefit we then split uh, between the TSOs, where you can say the country in Germany then pays 174 euro. Uh, but you, and, you, and you could say that if you did not have the flow of one gigawatt, then the price would probably have been even lower in Denmark and even higher in Germany. So there is also a, a, a benefit for the uh, uh, producer in Denmark and the consumer in, in, in Germany. Uh, from this, so uh, there is a benefit for both the consumer and producer, but also for the TSOs, and we can then use this uh, uh, congestion rent to uh, build our transmission. Okay, and that's sort of related to, there's mm -hmm. another question here about um, after you put an interconnector into service, then the congestion rents are going to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you won't be able to use as much, you won't have as much congestion rent to pay for the new interconnector. Once you put it into place, yeah. yeah. So, so you can say that that uh, it would not be beneficial to have uh, free flow of electricity at all time. So, uh, some congestion is good, and and then the the difficulty is to find that uh, uh, optimum. What is the optimum level of uh, transmission and uh, congestion, so that you can uh, get a balance between the social economic benefit and then the uh, investment costs. And, and of course, the electricity markets helps you by, by, by doing this, but there can also be other benefits, for example, on, on increased competition, on, on the security of supply that is more national and, and not something that you uh, can share between the countries. Um, so, so also for some of the interconnectors we have built out, we can see that there is a, a benefit for security of supply. So uh, the, the build out may also be, be based on that, but it is good to have some congestion. It should not be... Uh, uh, hundred uh, percent open. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions around the, uh, the planning, um, which, um, I think they're asking about the TYNDP, the NSOE TYNDP planning process, asking about how you, um, do the scenario forecasts mm. and get agreement among countries yeah. and asking what kind of program or software you use to model this. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think I would actually uh, recommend to look at, at the report because there it's very well described 
Uh, and it is then done in, in this working group in, in, in SOE, our uh, organization of all the, the TSOs in Europe. And, and they're doing a fantastic job because it is really a, a discussion to agree among all countries and, and also what, what should the scenarios look like. But uh, that is where we have NSOE that, that facilitates that. And, and, and of course, you would say may, maybe the first uh, tenure network development plan that was made uh, some years ago was probably the most difficult one. Because when you first have made the first one, then you can build on that for the next and the third and the fourth one. So, uh, but I would recommend to look at, at uh, actually the latest report, and there is a number of links uh, there when you get the slides. Okay, excellent. Um, well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, <clears throat> we're going to need to wrap up. I want to thank you again, Peter, for an extremely yeah. informative, really timely presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to send out an email um, about the link to the video file, the questions that we didn't get to, and um, uh, the presentation uh, PDF will be available. Mm -hmm. We appreciate everyone's engagement. Mm -hmm. um, next month's webinar is going to be on December 13th, uh, and Ryan Quint of NERC will speak on modeling of inverter-based resources. And... Uh, Information on all of our webinars and meetings can be found on our website at esig.energy um, and also in our newsletters, informational emails. You're all invited to attend. So, Peter, thank you again. This has been extremely useful. Uh, thanks to all of the participants for your interest, and we look forward to seeing you all again um, in the near future. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.